This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 10. After breakfast, I wanted to talk about the dead man and guess out how he came to be killed. But Jim didn't want to. He said it would fetch bad luck. And besides, he said he might come and haunt us. He said a man that wasn't buried was more likely to go a-haunting around than one that was planted and comfortable. That sounded pretty reasonable, so I didn't say no more. But I couldn't keep from studying over it and wishing I knowed who shot the man and what they done it for. We rummaged the clothes we'd got and found eight dollars in silver sewed up in the lining of an old blanket overcoat. Jim said he reckoned the people in that house stole the coat, because if they'd knowed the money was there, they wouldn't have left it. I said I reckon they killed him, too, but Jim didn't want to talk about that. I says, Now, you think it's bad luck, but what did you say when I fetched in the snakeskin that I found on the top of the ridge day before yesterday? You said it was the worst bad luck in the world to touch snakeskin with my hands. Well, here's your bad luck. We've raked in all this truck and eight dollars besides. I wish we could have some bad luck like this every day, Jim. Never you mind, honey, never you mind. Don't you get too pert. It's a-coming. Mind, I tell you, it's a-coming. It did come, too. It was a Tuesday that we had that talk. Well, after dinner Friday, we was laying around in the grass at the upper end of the ridge and got out of tobacco. I went to the cavern to get some, and found a rattlesnake in there. I killed him and curled him up on the foot of Jim's blanket, ever so natural, thinking there'd be some fun when Jim found him there. Well, by night, I forgot all about the snake, and when Jim flung himself down on the blanket while I struck a light, the snake's mate was there and bit him. He jumped up yelling, and the first thing the light showed was the varmint curled up and ready for another spring. I laid him out in a second with a stick, and Jim grabbed Pap's whiskey jug and began to pour it down. He was barefooted, and the snake bit him right on the heel. That all comes of my being such a fool as to not remember that wherever you leave a dead snake, its mate always comes there and curls around it. Jim told me to chop off the snake's head and throw it away, and then skin the body and roast a piece of it. I done it, and he eat it, and said it would help cure him. He made me take off the rattles and tie them around his wrist, too. He said that that would help. Then I slid out quiet and throwed the snakes clear away amongst the bushes, for I weren't going to let Jim find out it was all my fault, not if I could help it. Jim sucked and sucked at the jug, and now and then he got out of his head and pitched around and yelled, but every time he come to himself, he went to sucking at the jug again. His foot swelled up pretty big, and so did his leg, but by and by the drunk begun to come, and so I judged he was all right, but I'd rather been bit with a snake than Pap's whiskey. Jim was laid up for four days and nights. Then the swelling was all gone, and he was around again. I made up my mind I wouldn't ever take a holt of a snake skin again with my hands, now that I see what had come of it. Jim said he reckoned I would believe him next time, and he said that handling a snake skin was such awful bad luck that maybe we hadn't got to the end of it yet. He said he'd rather see the new moon over his left shoulder as much as a thousand times than take up a snake skin in his hand. Well, I was getting to feel that way myself, though I've always reckoned that looking at the new moon over your left shoulder is one of the carelessest and foolishest things a body can do. Old Hank Bunker done it once and bragged about it, and in less than two years he got drunk and fell off of the shot tower and spread himself out so that he was just a kind of layer, as you may say, and they slid him edgeways between two barn doors for a coffin and buried him so, so they say, but I didn't see it. Pap told me. But anyway, it all come of looking at the moon that way, like a fool. Well, the days went along, and the river went down between its banks again, and about the first thing we done was to bait one of the big hooks with a skinned rabbit, and set it, and catch a catfish that was as big as a man, being six foot two inches long, and weighed over two hundred pounds. We couldn't handle him, of course. He would have flung us into Illinois. We just sat there and watched him rip and tear around till he drowned we found a brass button in his stomach, and a round ball, and lots of rubbish. We split the ball open with the hatchet, 
and there was a spool in it. Jim said he'd had it there a long time to coat it over so and make a ball of it. It was as big a fish as was ever catched in the Mississippi, I reckon. Jim said he hadn't ever seen a bigger one. He would have been worth a good deal over at the village. They peddle out such a fish as that by the pound in the market house there. Everybody buys some of him. His meat's as white as snow and makes a good fry. Next morning I said it was getting slow and dull, and I wanted to get a stirring up some way. I said I reckoned I would slip over the river and find out what was going on. Jim liked that notion, but he said I must go in the dark and look sharp. Then he studied it over and said, Couldn't I put on some of them old things and dress up like a girl? That was a good notion, too. So we shortened up one of the calico gowns, and I turned up my trouser legs to my knees and got into it. Jim hitched it behind with the hooks, and it was a fair fit. I put on the sunbonnet and tied it under my chin, and then for a body to look in and see my face was like looking down a joint of stovepipe. Jim said nobody would know me, even in the daytime hardly. I practiced around all day to get the hang of the things, and by and by I could do pretty well in them. Only Jim said I didn't walk like a girl, and he said I must quit pulling up my gown to get at my breeches pocket. I took notice and done better. I started up the Illinois shore in the canoe just after dark. I started to cross to the town from a little below the ferry landing, and the drift of the current fetched me in at the bottom of the town. I tied up and started along the bank. There was a light burning in a little shanty that hadn't been lived in for a long time, and I wondered who had took up quarters there. I slipped up and peeped in at the window. There was a woman, about forty year old in there, knitting by a candle that was on a pine table. I didn't know her face. She was a stranger, for you couldn't start a face in that town that I didn't know. Now, this was lucky, because I was weakening. I was getting afraid I had come. People might know my voice and find me out. But if this woman had been in such a little town two days, she could tell me all I wanted to know. So I knocked at the door and made up my mind I wouldn't forget I was a girl. End of chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February. 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 11. Come in, says the woman, and I did. She says, Take a cheer. I done it. She looked me all over with her little shiny eyes and says, What might your name be? Sarah Williams. Whereabouts do you live? In this neighborhood? Nome, in Hookerville, seven mile below. I've walked all the way, and I'm all tired out. Hungry, too, I reckon. I'll find you something. No, I ain't hungry. I was so hungry I had to stop two miles below here at a farm. So I ain't hungry no more. It's what makes me so late. My mother's down sick and out of money and everything. And I come to tell my Uncle Abner Moore. He lives at the upper end of the town, she says. I ain't ever been here before. Do you know him? No, but I don't know everybody yet. I haven't lived here quite two weeks. It's a considerable ways to the upper end of the town. You better stay here all night. Take off your bonnet. No, I says, I'll rest a while, I reckon, and go on. I ain't afeard of the dark. She said she wouldn't let me go by myself, but her husband would be in by and by, maybe in an hour and a half, and she'd send him along with me. Then she got to talking about her husband, and about her relations up the river, and her relations down the river, and about how much better off they used to was, and how they didn't know but they'd made a mistake coming to our town, instead of letting well alone, and so on and so on, till I was afeard I had made a mistake coming to her to find out what was going on in the town. But by and by she dropped on to Pap and the murder, and then I was pretty willing to let her clatter right along. She told about me and Tom Sawyer finding the six thousand dollars, only she got it ten, and all about Pap and what a hard lot he was, and what a hard lot I was, and at last she got down to where I was murdered. I says, Who done it? We've heard considerable about these goings on down in Hookerville, but we don't know who twas that killed Huck Finn. Well, I reckon there's a right smart chance of people here that'd like to know who killed him. Some think old Finn done it himself. No, is that so? Most everybody thought it at first. 
"'He'll never know how nigh he came to getting lynched. "'But before night they changed around "'and judged it was done by a runaway nigger named Jim. "'Why, he—' "'I stopped. "'I reckoned I better keep still. "'She run on and never noticed I had put in at all. "'The nigger run off the very night Huck Finn was killed. "'So there's a reward out for him, three hundred dollars. "'And there's a reward out for old Finn, too, two hundred dollars. "'You see, he came to town the morning after the murder and told about it, "'and was out with them on the ferry-boat hunt, "'and right away after he up and left. "'Before night they wanted to lynch him, but he was gone, you see. "'Well, next day they found out the nigger was gone. "'They found out he hadn't been seen since ten o'clock the night the murder was done. "'So then they put it on him, you see, "'and while they was full of it, next day back comes old Finn, "'and went boo-hooing to Judge Thatcher to get money "'to hunt for the nigger all over Illinois with.' The judge gave him some, and that evening he got drunk, and was around till after midnight, with a couple of mighty hard-looking strangers, and then went off with them. Well, he hain't come back since, and they hain't looking for him back till this thing blows over a little, for people thinks now that he'd killed his boy and fixed things so folks would think robbers done it, and then he'd get Huck's money without having to bother a long time with a lawsuit. People do say he weren't any too good to do it. Oh, he's sly, I reckon. If he don't come back for a year, he'll be all right. You can't prove anything on him, you know. Everything will be quieted down then, and he'll walk in Huck's money as easy as nothing. Yes, I reckon so, ma'am. I don't see nothing in the way of it. Has everybody quit thinking the nigger done it? Oh, no, not everybody. A good many thinks he done it. But they'll get the nigger pretty soon now, and maybe they can scare it out of him. Why, are they after him yet? "'Well, you're innocent, ain't you? "'Just three hundred dollars lay around every day for people to pick up? "'Some folks think the nigger ain't far from here. "'I'm one of them, but I hain't talked it around. "'A few days ago I was talking with an old couple "'that lives next door in the log shanty, "'and they happened to say hardly anybody ever goes to that island over yonder "'that they call Jackson's Island. "'Don't anybody live there?' says I. "'No, nobody,' they says. "'I didn't say any more, but I done some thinkin'. I was pretty near certain I'd seen smoke over there about the head of the island a day or two before that. So I says to myself, like as not, that nigger's hiding over there. Anyway, says I, it's worth the trouble to give the place a hunt. I hain't seen any smoke since, so I reckon maybe he's gone, if it was him. But my husband's going over to sea, him and another man. He was gone up the river, but he got back today, and I told him as soon as he got here two hours ago. I had got so uneasy, I couldn't sit still. I had to do something with my hands, so I took up a needle off of the table and went to threading it. My hands shook, and I was making a bad job of it. When the woman stopped talking, I looked up, and she was looking at me pretty curious and smiling a little. I put down the needle and thread and let on to be interested, and I was, too, and says, Three hundred dollars is a power of money. I wish my mother could get it. Is your husband going over there tonight? "'Oh, yes, he went uptown with the man I was telling you of, "'to get a boat and see if they could borrow another gun. "'They'll go over after midnight.' "'Couldn't they see better if they was to wait till daytime?' "'Yes, and couldn't the nigger see better, too? "'After midnight he'll likely be asleep, "'and they can slip around the woods "'and hunt up his campfire all the better for the dark, "'if he's got one.' "'I didn't think of that. "'The woman kept looking at me pretty curious, "'and I didn't feel a bit comfortable.' Pretty soon, she says, What did you say your name was, honey? Mm, Mary Williams. Somehow it didn't seem to me that I said it was Mary before, so I didn't look up. It seemed to me I said it was Sarah, so I felt sort of concerned, and was afeard maybe I was looking it too. I wish the woman would say something more. The longer she sat still, the uneasier I was. But now she says, Honey, I thought you said it was Sarah when you first came in. "'Oh, yes, I did. Sarah Mary Williams. Sarah's my first name. Some calls me Sarah. Some calls me Mary.' "'Oh, that's the way of it?' "'Yes, am "'I was feeling better then, but I wished I was out of there anyway. I couldn't look up yet. "'Well, the woman fell to talking about how hard times was, and how poor they had to live, and how the rats was as free as if they owned the place, and so forth and so on. And then I got easy again.' She was right about the rats. You'd see one stick his nose out of a hole in the corner every little while. She said she had to have things handy to throw at them when she was alone, or they wouldn't give her no peace. 
She showed me a bar of lead twisted up into a knot, and said she was a good shot with it generally, but she'd wrenched her arm a day or two ago and didn't know whether she could throw true now. But she watched for a chance and directly banged away at a rat, but she missed him wide and said, Ouch! It hurt her arm so. Then she told me to try for the next one. I wanted to be getting away before the old man got back, but of course I didn't let on. I got the thing, and the first rat that showed his nose I let drive, and if he'd have stayed where he was, he'd have been a tolerable sick rat. She said that was first rate, and she reckoned I would hive the next one. She went and got the lump of lead and fetched it back, and brought along a hank of yarn, which she wanted me to help her with. I held up my two hands, and she put the hank over them, and went on talking about her and her husband's matters. But she broke off to say, "'Keep your eye on the rats. You better have the lead in your lap, Handy.' So she dropped the lump into my lap just at that moment, and I clapped my legs together on it, and she went on talking. But only about a minute. Then she took off the hank, and looked at me straight in the face, and very pleasant, and says, "'Come now, what's your real name?' "'What, what mum? What's your real name? Is it Bill, or Tom, or Bob, or what is it?' I reckon I shook like a leaf, and I didn't know hardly what to do. But I says, Please don't poke fun at a poor girl like me, Mum. If I'm in the way here, I'll... No, you won't. Sit down and stay where you are. I ain't going to hurt you, and I ain't going to tell on you, nother. You just tell me your secret and trust me. I'll keep it, and what's more, I'll help you. So will my old man, if you want him to. You see, there's a runaway prentice, that's all. It ain't nothing. There ain't no harm in it. "'You've been treated bad, and you made up your mind to cut. "'Bless you, child, I wouldn't tell on you. "'Tell me all about it now. That's a good boy.' "'So I said it wouldn't be no use to try to play it any longer, "'and I would just make a clean breast and tell her everything, "'but she mustn't go back on her promise. "'Then I told her my father and mother was dead, "'and the law had bound me out to a mean old farmer in the country, thirty mile back from the river, "'and he treated me so bad I couldn't stand it no longer.' He went away to be gone a couple of days, so I took my chance and stole some of his daughter's old clothes and cleared out, and I had been three nights coming the thirty miles. I traveled nights and hid daytimes and slept, and the bag of bread and meat I carried from home lasted me all the way, and I had a plenty. I said I believed my Uncle Abner Moore would take care of me, and so that was why I struck out for this town of Goshen. Goshen, child, this ain't Goshen. This is St. Petersburg. Goshen's ten mile further up the river. Who told you this was Goshen? Why, I met a man at daybreak this morning, just as I was going to turn into the woods for my regular sleep. He told me when the roads forked I must take the right hand, and five mile would fetch me to Goshen. He was drunk, I reckon. He told you just exactly wrong. Well, he did act like he was drunk, but it ain't no matter now. I got to be moving along. I'll fetch Goshen before daylight. Hold on a minute. I'll put you up a snack to eat. You might want it. So she put me up a snack and says, Say, when a cow's laying down, which end of her gets up first? Answer up prompt now. Don't stop to study over it. Which end gets up first? The hind end, mum. Well, then, a horse? The forward end, mum. Which side of a tree does the moss grow on? North side. If fifteen cows is browsing on a hillside, how many of them eats with their heads pointing in the same direction? The whole fifteen, mum. Well, I reckon you have lived in the country. I thought maybe you was trying to hocus me again. What's your real name now? George Peters, mum. Well, try to remember it, George. Don't forget and tell me it's Alexander before you go, and then get out by saying it's George Alexander when I catch you. And don't go about women in that old calico. "'You do a girl tolerable poor, but you might fool men, maybe. "'Bless you, child. When you set out to thread a needle, "'don't hold the thread still and fetch the needle up to it. "'Hold the needle still and poke the thread at it. "'That's the way a woman most always does it, "'but a man always does it the other way. "'When you throw at a rat or anything, "'hitch yourself up a tiptoe and fetch your hand up over your head "'as awkward as you can, and miss your rat about six or seven foot. "'Throw a stiff arm from the shoulder.' "'like there was a pivot there for it to turn on, like a girl, "'not from the wrist and elbow with your arm out to one side like a boy. "'And mind you, when a girl tries to catch anything in her lap, "'she throws her knees apart. "'She don't clap them together, the way you did when you catch the lump of lead. 
Why, I spotted you for a boy when you was threading the needle, and I contrived the other things just to make certain. Now, trot along to your uncle, Sarah Mary Williams, George Alexander Peters, and if you get into trouble, you send word to Mrs. Judith Loftus, which is me, and I'll do what I can to get you out of it. Keep the river road all the way, and next time you tramp, take shoes and socks with you. The river road's a rocky one, and your feet'll be in a condition when you get to Goshen, I reckon. I went up the bank about fifty yards, and then I doubled on my tracks and slipped back to where my canoe was, a good piece below the house. I jumped in and was off in a hurry. I went upstream far enough to make the head of the island, and then started across. I took off the sunbonnet, for I didn't want no blinders on then. When I was about the middle, I heard the clock begin to strike, so I stops and listens. The sound come faint over the water, but clear. Eleven. When I struck the head of the island, I never waited to blow, though I was most winded, but I shoved right into the timber where my old camp used to be, and started a good fire there on a high and dry spot. Then I jumped in the canoe and dug out for our place, a mile and a half below, as hard as I could go. I landed and slapped through the timber and up the ridge and into the cavern. There Jim laid, sound asleep on the ground. I roused him out and says, "'Get up and hump yourself, Jim. There ain't a minute to lose. They're after us.' Jim never asked no questions. He never said a word. But the way he worked for the next half an hour showed about how he was scared. By that time everything we had in the world was on our raft, and she was ready to be shoved out from the willow cove where she was hid. We put out the campfire at the cavern the first thing, and didn't show a candle outside after that. I took the canoe out from the shore a little piece, and took a look, but if there was a boat around I couldn't see it, for stars and shadows ain't good to see by. Then we got out the raft and slipped along down in the shade, past the foot of the island, dead still, never saying a word. End of chapter 11